Hi, my name is Jeff Cowden. I'm the curator and head of learning at the Wordsworth Trust. And we may be here in this room today, but we're actually beaming, the, broadcasting to the world at large. This is our first ever live stream on a Saturday talk. Uh, so that's why we certainly have to start on time for our worldwide audience. Um, I have a couple of things to say. One is, I hope it's okay that we do this, but the only filming that we're going to do is from the front, so you, you won't be in it, if that's, if that's okay. And the other thing is, um, I'm uh, required to read out that if there is a, an emergency, we're not expecting a fire drill, so if the alarms go off, it's for real, and that uh, we'll leave people that way out the door, and also this way here, but there's plenty of us here to, to, lead, you, to lead you out. Um, that's the formalities. Um, I would just like to say a very, very warm welcome to people uh, if this is your first visit to the German Centre. Um, we're, we're in here, we're surrounded by the great books of English Romanticism. We have Wordsworth on one side, and we have Byron, Keats, Shelley, Quincy, Sandley, all around us. So it's, it's great surroundings for a, for a talk such as this. Um, it's a very special day too, um, because this is, the, this is the, the, the first day of the last exhibition in the museum as we know it. And that's quite a moment. We had a, a ceremonial pulling in of the last screw last night, <laughs> um, which we filmed, and of course social media got to see it, uh, pulling in the last screw of the last picture to be hung in the exhibition room. And that's after 37 years of exhibitions in that space. And uh, the first one I remember was the, was the art of Donna Wilkinson, the, the, the Northumbrian-based artist. And there's been many great things in that room since. I don't know how the wall's still standing. It must be so full of holes. <laughs> with polyfiller in them. I don't know how they're still there, but um, it's, a bit, it's a great moment. And there couldn't be a better show, really, to, to end the, this great run. Um, we're marking the ascent of Scarfell Pike by Dorothy Worth, Mary Barker, three others, um, on the 7th of October, 1818. And it's a remarkable thing. It's pioneering because Scarfell Pike, Scarfell, were barely mentioned on the maps at the time. Helvellyn was one thing, Skiddo was a, was a walked hill but less so the Scarfell. Remarkable too, because of course it was two women, uh, at a time when women weren't, uh, wasn't so common to, to climb mountains, and remarkable too because of the account that Dorothy left us with. And that's what is the basis for our exhibition, it's the basis for our programme of events coming up, and when we finish the talk today, we'll go next door, see the exhibition, uh, have a glass of wine, have a celebration of that moment, um, but this is also the moment to congratulate Melissa and Joe Taylor for the exhibition itself. It's, I think it looks stunning. Um, they've put the, the body of the exhibition together. It's been wonderfully complemented by two other artists. One, uh, Alex Jacob Whitworth, who's contributed three pictures to it. She is being Dorothy Wordsworth. Ask, ask her at the drinks what that means. But, but Alex is being Dorothy for the few months leading up to the climb of the hill. And uh, Louise Ann Wilson, you may remember I mentioned at previous events the idea of re-walking for people, people who used to walk and no longer walk. Well, Louise has done walks for people, a number of people, and she's created a wonderful exhibition uh, in its, as part of the, the, the Dorothy main story. So there's lots to look forward to. So after, that's after the talk. The talk itself, Dr. Joe Taylor, um, she's had a busy time. She's been working on the exhibition, and she's changed jobs. Um, yesterday she was at, at Lancaster University, uh, today she's at Manchester University. Uh, she's got a title that I have to write down, um, and I still can't read the writing, Presidential Academic Fellow in Digital Humanities at Manchester University. So, congratulations on playing your new role, and thanks for coming to us on your first day. Um, Joe, you may remember, gave a talk, or well, some of you will remember, gave a talk on Harvey Colwood recently. She's been a great friend of the Trust, um, as has Lancaster University, as at many universities, and uh, has played a leading role in this project altogether. So, can we please welcome Dr. Joe Taylor? Thanks so much for that, Jeff, and to everyone for coming. I literally can't think of a better way to spend the first day in a new job than, um, than talking about an exhibition that's uh, been a real labour of love for. Um, for nearly a year, actually, I realised when, um, when I was looking back over some notes this week. Alright, so I want to talk, to talk today about Dorothy Wordsworth as, um, as a pioneer of, of mountaineering. Not, not even just women's mountaineering. Uh, she was at the forefront of the development of the sport from the late 18th century and into the first few decades of the 19th. 
In her poem, Grasmere, a fragment, Dorothy describes a cottage nestled in the trees in Grasmere Valley. She admits that visitors to the village might find other dwellings with their fertile fields and hedgerows green more appealing. I blame the wanderer not, she writes. Um, and she says that she doesn't blame them for preferring those more picturesque cottages, but she feels a kinship with what she calls this lonely shed. I love that house because it is the very mountain's child, she writes. The poem describes her first sight of that dear abode while she was still a stranger in Grasmere Vale, and it goes on to describe a walk in which she begins to explore the area. And I'd actually really like to, to read out the poem in its entirety. Um, despite it being called a fragment, it's a reasonably long one. Um, but I think it, we don't hear enough of Dorothy's poetry generally. Um, in fact, we might say that we don't hear enough poetry generally. And it's, it captures something of the, of the tone, of the mood that I want to, to explore <coughs> in the course of the next 50 minutes or so. So this is Grasmere, a fragment. Peaceful our valley, fair and green, and beautiful her cottages, each in its nook, its sheltered hold, or underneath its tuft of trees. Many and beautiful they are. But there is one that I love best, a lowly shed, in truth it is, a brother of the rest. Yet when I sit on rock or hill, down looking on the valley fair, that cottage with its clustering trees summons my heart. It settles there. Others there are whose small domain of fertile fields and hedgerows green might more seduce a wanderer's mind to wish that there his home had been. Such wish be his. I blame him not. My fancies they perchance are wild. I love that house because it is the very mountain's child. Fields have it of its own, green fields, but they are rocky, steep and bare. Their fences of the mountain stone and moss and lichen flourish there. And when the storm comes from the north, it lingers near that pastoral spot, and piping through the mossy walls, it seems delighted with its lot. And let it take its own delight, and let it range the pastures bare, until it reach that group of trees, it may not enter there. A green unfading grove it is, scattered with many a lesser tree, hazel and holly, beech and oak, a bright and flourishing company. Precious the shelter of those trees, they screen the cottage that I love. The sunshine pierces to the roof, and the tall pine trees tower above. When first I saw that dear abode, it was a lovely winter's day. After a night of perilous storm, the west wind ruled with gentle sway. A day so mild it might have been the first day of the gladsome spring. The robins warbled, and I heard one solitary throstle sing. A stranger grass near in thy vale, all faces then to me unknown. I left my sole companion friend to wander out alone. Lured by a little winding path, I quitted soon the public road. A smooth and tempting path it was, by sheep and shepherds trod. Eastward towards the lofty hills, this pathway led me on, until I reached a stately rock, with velvet moss o'ergrown. With russet oak and tufts of fern, its top was richly garlanded, its sides adorned with eglantine, bedropped with hips of glossy red. There too, in many a sheltered chink, the foxglove's broad leaves flourished fair, and silver birch whose purple twigs bend to the softest breathing air. Beneath that rock, my course I stayed, and looking to its summit high. Thou wearest, I said, a splendid garb, here winter keeps his revelry. For long the dweller on the plains, I grieved when summer days were gone. No more I'll grieve, for winter here hath pleasure gardens of his own. What need of flowers? The splendid moss is gayer than an April mead, more rich, it, rich its hues of various green, orange and gold and glittering red. Beside that gay and lovely rock, there came with merry voice, a foaming streamlet glancing by, it seemed to say rejoice. My youthful wishes all fulfilled, wishes matured by thoughtful choice. I stood an inmate of this vale, and how could I but rejoice? So I want to spend a, a, a couple of minutes with this poem, having a look at a, a couple of those moments in a little bit more detail. So the first, um, the first moment that I think is really important in this, um, in this poem is, for our purposes today at least, is this one, where she writes that she leaves her companion. I left my sole companion friend. I think if we're all happy to read this poem biographically, we can safely assume that this companion friend might be William. And Dorothy discovers in this moment that walking in the mountains can uncover a sort of liberating sense of independence. 
and she takes us along with her. That path tempts her on, and as Pamela Roth has written of another of Dorothy's walks, Dorothy always found the beckoning of the bending road irresistible. This road, or uh, this path, bends in unpredictable ways because, as she tells us, she leaves the public road and goes on to the shepherd's tracks, um, those kind of lesser explored old ways. The poem here, I think, stands in for the path that she describes, and we move with her along it, which Dorothy describes as a kind of characteristic vividness. She really pulls out those moments of the flowers blooming and the mosses laying on the rock faces. She pauses beneath what she calls that stately rock and enters into a conversation with the mountain. She compliments it on its splendid garb and muses that winter here hath pleasure gardens of his own. <coughs> that stream running down the mountain seems to reply to her. It calls out rejoice, as we've just heard. And standing on the mountainside, that, um, that sentiment, that rejoicing, seemed inevitable. But um, <laughs> in the poem, at least, it seems inevitable. She finishes off with that, um, that declaration that she stands now, an inmate of this veil. How could I but rejoice? So throughout the course of this poem, um, and this is really what I want to focus on throughout, um, throughout this paper, uh, that sense that walking in the mountains has achieved two main things for Dorothy. First, it's highlighted for her that her youthful wishes to live with her brother and to have the freedom to walk where she pleased had been granted. And second, there's that realisation of this intimate knowledge of the landscape that she's been able to develop through walking, and that's turned her from a stranger in Grasmere to an inmate, over the course of really just a few lines, um, or just a few steps. Standing beneath the rock, Dorothy seems to become absorbed by the mountain, and this is something that we'll see again when we get to Scarfell towards the end of the paper. Like the cottage, Dorothy becomes the mountain's very child because the uplands have birthed this new and profound sense of independence and creativity, a sense that, that's expressed in poems like this, but also in her, her letters and perhaps most famously in her journals. And it's beautifully captured, I think, by Alex Yakov Whitworth's logo for, for the exhibition that you'll see throughout the sides here and that you'll see beautifully adorning the panels that Melissa's done for the exhibition itself. So this then, this moment of, um, of leaving her sole companion um, and going off and exploring the, the pathways, both known and lesser known, around Grasmere Valley, is a really important moment for Dorothy, both personally and poetically. But more than that, it's really significant as one of the earliest instances of a woman claiming mountaineering as something that's crucial for her creativity and her identity. Um, this is a real trailblazing moment in a lot of different senses, I think. Dorothy's walking throughout her life was intimately bound up with her writing, and her achievements in both were not insignificant. The fact that I perhaps don't need to tell this audience, but I think it bears repeating as often as possible. She completed her first long distance walk from Kendall to Keswick in 1794 with her brother William, in the manner of an elopement, as Frances Wilson thinks. In 1803, William and, for a while at least, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, uh, um, and of course Dorothy, undertook a walking tour of Scotland, which Dorothy re recorded in her recollections of a tour made in Scotland. Later, in 1820, um, she went with, uh, with William and his wife Mary and a couple of family friends uh, to the Alps, where they completed a pedestrian tour that in some ways sought to recreate the tour that Wordsworth had done of the Alps in the 1790s. And that, that excursion also inspired a journal that Dorothy distributed among friends as a, as a sort of travel account. But the ascent of Scarfell Pike, the, um, the excursion that, as Jeff said, inspired uh, the This Girl Did exhibition, that excursion is particularly notable for the daring that it displays. This, this excursion up Scarfell Pike, the ascent of Scarfell, wasn't, um, it wasn't simply a, a mountain climb. It wasn't something that was um, a straightforward up and down. It was a rebellious act that really um, had long-lasting consequences. It opened up the mountain. Um, and from it, I think, mountaineering more broadly, for successive generations, um, particularly of women, throughout the 19th, 20th, and 21st centuries. But it does something more than that, as we'll see towards the end of the paper, and it's, um, as you'll see when, um, when we go through to the exhibition. Dorothy's account suggests alternative ways of understanding mountains that go beyond tales of sporting prowess. This is not simply a physical feat. 
As Dorothy knew, examining the details of the mountainside could be as rewarding as the views from the summit. So in recent years, histories of walking have really transformed popular and academic conceptions of what it means to explore the world by foot. But these accounts have often neglected the foundational role that women played in the development of recreational walking, and especially of mountaineering. There are a couple of, um, of important exceptions, of course. Um, Rebecca Solnit's uh, feminist intervention, Wanderlust, History of Walking, just published in 2001, is a, a pretty rare instance in which women are afforded a place in the history of the peripatetic. And more recently, um, and perhaps more famously, Robert McFarlane's reading of Nan Shepherd's The Living Mountain has encouraged a much greater rec recognition of women's place in the history of bell walking. Um, and Kerry Andrews at Edge Hill University has, um, has got some work forthcoming on women walkers, which really promises to transform our understandings of women's historical walking practices and the literature that they inspired. And what studies like these have done have, have really proved that it's vital that women's role in walking histories be unearthed. As we'll see uh, with Dorothy, walking allowed women to explore and express freedoms within societal boundaries in ways that had really important social and political and imaginative implications. And all of this has been true since the transformation of walking from something that was a necessity, a, a form of transportation, into an increasingly recreational activity from the late 18th century. In that period and into the early 19th century, walking increasingly became what Nicholas Rowe has called an expression of democratic mobility, at least for men. Um, it was perhaps a little bit trickier for women, um, and I'll come back to that in a moment. That democratic mobility was something that was exemplified by the extensive walking tours that William Wordsworth undertook across the Alps, or that Coleridge pursued across Wales in the 1790s. But those expressions of democratic sensibilities were dangerous in a fraught political climate. We might recall how William and Coleridge were followed by <coughs> a government spy as they strode around the Pontocks in the aftermath of the treason trials of 1794, as part of which their friend John Thurwell had been imprisoned. So um, this government official goes to the Quantocks and follows them around for a few days. Um, he thinks that what they're talking about is the best ways for the French to invade England via the Somerset coast. What they're actually talking about is a projected uh, poem on a uh, stream, a philosophical poem. Um, and he thinks too that when, when they refer to what he thinks uh, they're saying is spy nosy, what they're actually, they, he thought that he, they were talking about his rather prominent facial features. They were actually talking about Spinoza's philosophy, <laughs> um, not, the, not their finest moment, perhaps. <coughs> so walking then, as, as episodes like that really indicate, could be a dangerously radical act. And both William and Dorothy began walking as, as acts of rebellion, as we'll see in a moment. And that implication of a dangerous radicalism was doubly true for women. James Bazard noted that women travelling either unaccompanied or in groups without men were referred to as unprotected and looked at as scarce. Young women travelling any distance alone, he writes, were almost never to be encountered. And there were imaginative implications as well as practical ones for this restriction. Few women could experience the moments of imaginative intensity produced by wandering lonely as a cloud. That was something that Charlotte Bronte complained about when she visited the Lake District for the first time in July 1850. Bronte regretted the lack of freedom that she was afforded to wander alone over the mountains, and she wrote, The scenery is of course grand. Could I have wandered about amongst those hills alone, I could have drunk in all their beauty. Even in a carriage of company, it was very well. There's a real tension there, there's a real irritation there, really, between enjoying her companion's company, who seemed very nice, but they're really holding her back, and experiencing something of the Lake District's full majesty, its, its, um, its sublimity almost. She continues that, if I could have gone away by myself in amongst those grand hills and sweet dales, I should have drank in the full power of this glorious scenery. In company, this can hardly be. So immersing oneself in the mountain's beauty is, as Bronte implies, an experience that can be satisfactorily accessed only when one is alone. And as a result, it was something from which women were often excluded. Um, and we might think for a moment what um, the kind of poetic implications that might, or literary implications more broadly, that might have. But both Dorothy and William were instrumental in bringing about a changing attitude towards walking, which transformed it into the imaginative as well as 
physical activity, which we now tend to associate with romantic era writers. The words are so well aware and proud of the fact that their commitment to almost daily extensive walks was unusual. Thus, in September 1800, we find Dorothy explaining to her friend Jane Marshall that the frequency with which they walked and the distances they travelled was one of the household's irregular habits. William and Dorothy walked together most days for the best part of four decades. And Thomas de Quincey estimated that William walked 175,000 miles over his lifetime, and Dorothy can't have fallen that much short of this. Their contemporaries, quite rightly, thought that the fact that William continued to climb Helvellyn regularly well into his 70s, and with what some of his younger associates thought was a rather irritating energy, was remarkable. <laughs> And Dorothy herself bragged about the speed with which she could walk and how little fatigued she was afterwards until her mid-50s. She wrote to Sarah Coleridge as, um, as one example in 1818 um, that at 46, I can walk 16 miles in four hours and three quarters. So that's about four miles an hour around the Lakeland Fells. She does qualify that a little bit. She says that she takes short rests between on a blustering cold day without having felt any fatigue. Even so, I'm not sure that there's very many of us that could um, truthfully say four miles an hour is our standard pace wandering up and down the mountains. But Dorothy had had to wait really quite a long time for the sort of freedom needed to develop her mountaineering in, in that kind of impressive way. In her youth, her walking was restricted by her grandmother's strict rules. This is when she's in her, her sort of mid to late teens. It was one of the things that Dorothy disliked most about living in Penrith. She complained to Jane that she never went out but on a Sunday. When she was permitted to go and live with her aunt and uncle in 1788, she wrote that she was mad with joy at the prospect of having leisure to read, work, walk, do as I please. It was here that she took up what Ernest de Selincourt called her daring habit of taking long walks alone. And Dorothy wrote that she would walk as long as I can in the garden. And she said that she was particularly fond of a, moonlight, of a moonlight or twilight walk. It's at this moment that walking seems to take on an almost poetic capacity. And the connection that Dorothy draws, even at that early stage, um, and this is sort of pre-living with, with William, but she's still drawing that connection between reading, walking, and working. And that was a thing that was to become really important for, um, for her later life and for the later Wordsworth household. So William and Dorothy began to walk together when they were reunited in 1787. Um, and Dorothy's letters from this period anticipate her our Foxville and Grassmere journals in that they draw out those similar connections between a certain kind of walking, close companionship, and writing. When William came to visit her, Dorothy wrote, as Dorothy writes in May uh, 1791, they used to walk every morning about two hours. And every evening we went into the garden at four or half past four and used to pace backwards and forwards till six. I'm really interested by this idea of pacing backwards and forwards. Um, I think it seems a bit weird to us, but, um, but Dorothy recognises this activity as a distinctive practice, and it serves particular purposes for both of them. So she, Dorothy wrote to Jane that, unless you have accustomed yourself to this kind of walking, you'll have no idea that it can be pleasant, but I assure you it is most delightful. And she offered to introduce Jane to this plan, so long as she was not afraid of the evening air. When Jane had joined them for a bit in, in 1793, Dorothy rhapsodised about a fantasy in which she, Jane and William shared a cottage which they would call their own, Dorothy writes, and be the happiest of human beings. This vision is really remarkably close to the life that she and William would later share with Mary. And for Dorothy, like for William, Walking is, is already emerging as a creative, poetic practice that, that develops and expresses her rootedness in place, and that's a thing that becomes really important, as we've seen with the Grassmere fragment um, in the lakes later on. Things really, really changed for Dorothy once she'd moved in with William. She began to experience a much greater freedom, and um, as Pamela again has pointed out, from that point, Dorothy lived in a much more spacious freedom than most of us. She had no children, she wasn't married, um, although she helped out a lot with the, um, the housework and, um, and with the kids when they started arriving. She wasn't tied to the house in the same way that, um, that Mary, for example, was. <coughs> Dorothy continued to be amused by her friends, and particularly her male friends, concerns over her safety and comfort when she went out walking. 
So uh, in one instance in 1802, she was returning home from the Clarkson's house in, uh, on near Oldswater. And she writes to Catherine Clarkson that their worries have been misplaced since she reached home before five o'clock on the Sunday afternoon without being in the least heated or fatigued. So of course she wasn't Dorothy Randy writes that she's heated or fatigued. The clouds that Thomas Clarkson had been so anxious about were to Dorothy nothing more than passing features of aesthetic interest. They connected the whole Vale of Brothers Water, she noted, with the sky enclosing it so that there seemed no other place beyond. And indeed, it seemed as beautiful a place as there need be in a beautiful world. Those clouds, like the mountains themselves, seemed to enfold Dorothy as she walked. They seemed to embed her in the valley. And moments like this are, I think, a kind of proof of Dorothy's highly self-conscious development of a really rebellious walking practice in two ways. Firstly, she deliberately articulates a sense of becoming rooted in, um, in the landscape, and she acknowledges how walking offers her unique and intimate insights into a place's rhythms and its emotions. But second, and perhaps more importantly, her amusement at the Clarkson's anxiety indicates her awareness that in walking in, this, in the way that she did, she was confronting gender norms, and to a large extent, she was winning. So we've seen already that walking was at the root of, of much of both Dorothy and William's writing. What or who they saw, heard, and touched as they walked inspired their poems, and the rhythms of their walking infiltrated their poetry and prose. Although William and Dorothy both considered walking to be central to their creative practices, they came at it with what Dorothy calls different plans. So this is, um, this is where that walking backwards and forwards really comes into its own. William chose his regular routes carefully, we're told, so that his physical rhythms would encourage the desired verse form. William hasn't recognised as much when he recorded in his essay on my first acquaintance with poets. Um, you can't spoil it this already, but he writes in on my first acquaintance with poets that Coleridge had told him that he himself likes to compose in walking over uneven ground or breaking through the straggling branches of a copsewood. Wordsworth all on a straight gravel walk or in some spot where the continuity of his verse met with no collateral interruption. It seems remarkably appropriate for both poets. <laughs> Dorothy describes that, that process, that walking backwards and forwards up the gravel walk, in more detail. And her journals refer repeatedly to walking backwards and forwards with William along a defined stretch of path. De Quincey recorded that locals were bemused by the sight of William bum bum bumming, or working out the rhythm of his, um, as his verse as he walked up and down often with Dorothy following behind to write the poem down. Now, that Wordsworthian in practice is pretty well known, but what's been less commented on is the fact that it's actually Dorothy, as we've, we've seen already, that seemed to introduce William to that particular plan. And Dorothy, though, didn't initiate it for creative ends. For her, as I've implied already, it was a practical response to those limitations imposed on her by her relative sense of social decorum. But when Dorothy did accompany William on these kind of metronomic walks, she discovered a different kind of connection with the landscape. If William used walking to seek a deeper connection to his inner self, and so to his poetic practice, Dorothy used it to develop her relationship with the landscape. So let's take this moment. When um, Dorothy is describing in her journal a walk that she and Mary have undertaken to Easdale, one of her favourites. She says, after dinner, it was agreed that we should walk. When I had finished a letter to Coleridge, part of which I had written in the morning by the kitchen fire, while the, most, while the mutton was roasting. Mary and I walked into Easdale and backwards and forwards in that large field under George Rawlson's white cottage. We had intended gathering mosses, and for that purpose we turned into the green lane behind the tailors, but it was too dark to see the mosses. The river came galloping past the church as fast as it could come. And when we got into Easdale, we saw Chandler Falls like a broad stream of snow. She continues. At, at the little footbridge, we stopped to look at the company of rivers which came hurrying down the vale, this way and that. It was a valley of streams and islands with that great waterfall at the head and lesser falls in different parts of the mountains coming down to these rivers. So initially, that backwards and forwards pattern of, uh, of the walk seemed to be merely companionable. It's a pretty convenient route for the two women's conversation. But as she goes on, it morphs into a form of motion that affords Dorothy a moment of, of a kind of serene embeddedness in the mountains. I absolutely love this paragraph. Um, I hope you'll see why. So she goes on to say, 
We could hear the sound of those lesser falls, but we could not see them. We walked backwards and forwards to all distant objects, except the white shape of the waterfall and the lines of the mountains were gone. We had the crescent moon when we went out, and on our return there were a few stars that shone, shone dimly, but it was a grey, cloudy night. I really love this moment because there's a real sense of, um, of absorption into the mountains that becomes almost physical, it's almost visceral. Um, and Dor Dora Wordsworth's friend, Mariah Jane Dewsbury, said that Dorothy was uh, a kind of embodied spell. So powerful was the effect of her vitality on those around her. And I feel like that kind of magic really radiates from entries like this one. In a literal sense, Dorothy and Mary walk until the mountains disappear into the coming night. But in a literary sense, the moment also indicates Dorothy's sense of, or at least desire to be, absorbed into the landscape. If William in Home at Grasmere begged the hills to enfold him and close him in, Dorothy already seems to have found out how to get into their embrace. As we saw earlier with Grasmere, a fragment, Dorothy embeds herself in the landscape by walking in it and by attending to the details that moving slowly over the mountains reveals. <coughs> this is something that really comes into its own when she climbs Scarfell Pike on October the 7th, 1818, um, which, as as we've said, was perhaps one of Dorothy's most significant mountaineering achievements. In climbing Scarfell Pike, she not only became one of the first women to climb the mountain, and it's certainly the earliest record of an ascent by a woman that we've been able to find, um, but it, she's also one of the first people to record doing so. Samuel Taylor Coleridge is uh, famously the other notable early instance of, um, of writing down uh, an excursion up and um, more problematically for him, down a Scarfell um, in 1802, but there's a, there's a real gap um, between, between those years, and it actually wasn't until several decades later that Scarfell becomes a regular part of um, tourists and travellers' routes through the lakes. And climbing the Scarfell Massif is even more um, impressive when we remember that, that in this period, the Lakeland Mountains uh, tended to be characterised as being either masculine or feminine. So mountains like Skiddaw or the Langdales, uh, which could be largely traversed on horseback or even um, to, to a large extent by a coach, were considered appropriate for women mountaineers. Others, like Helvellyn, were not, as Dora Wordsworth found as late as 1840. Um, this is a, a really lovely moment in, in the exhibition, I think. Dora, um, we see a different side to Dora uh, in, in this exchange. She. Uh, she found out that her father and her husband, Edward Glennon, were planning on going up Helvellyn. Uh, they said she wasn't allowed to come. She said, well, I'd really quite like to. And they said, uh, or Wordsworth rather said, no, you're, you're not coming. You're not strong enough. You're not, you're not fit enough. You're, you can stay here. She argues her point, though, and eventually they compromise. Um, and she ends up riding up it on a rather reluctant pony. Um, and Ed Edward Cullinan um, records that he, or the locals, seemed to think that no lady had ever done this before. The pony seems to indicate there's a good reason why. <laughs> but um, but Scarfell, um, the, the whole Scarfell Massif, not, not just the pike, was barely climbed at all. Um, its, its extreme vertiginousness put off all but the very hardiest mountaineers, and of course the locals who merrily farmed it as part of their day-to-day -day working life, but, um, but mountaineering-wise, it was largely excluded from this mountain canon until um, the sort of early, mid-19th century, from about the 1830s onwards, we start reading more about it. But it has to wait a while for, um, for people to start going there with any regularity. So Dorothy's ascent, ascent of Scarfell Pike, then, is even more remarkable in that context. And she records the ascent of the mountain in a letter <coughs> written to William Johnson, uh, Grasmere's former curate only part of which, um, in fact, none of the original letter survives, does it? So, um, there's, but there's two copies of it. Uh, fortunately, that account was considered by Dorothy's friends and family to be of sufficient literary merit to be transcribed into a fair copy. Um, and it was included without attribution in William's Guide to the District of the Lakes from the second edition in 1822. As um, Pamela pointed out in, um, in the other room a, a minute ago, that's not necessarily because William was being horrible to Dorothy. She was... Um, notoriously kind of reticent about taking credit for her work. But still, it meant that many of the people who followed in the guide's footsteps believed that it was William who they were emulating. And it's a fallacy that actually still continues to be repeated in both popular and academic responses to the guide. 
William wasn't present on the time, and I think it, it does something really important to our understandings of the history of mountaineering if we continue to believe that it's William that is writing this account. So Dorothy undertook the ascent of Scarfell Pike on October the 7th, 1818, with her friend Mary Barker, who she tells us is an unmarried lady who lived in Borrowdale. She lived in a house that Robert Sowley called the Forley uh, because it was built so close to the river and he was pretty sure it was going to flood them all. And he, he was right, but it's, it's a very lovely house. It's the Scarfell Hotel um, today, which has just been refurbished following flooding in uh, <laughs> Salt Desmond. <laughs> Um, so Dorothy reported that Miss Barker, um, Mary Barker, had been bewitched with the charms of the rocks and streams and mountains belonging to that secluded spot, and had there built herself a house. Mary occupied herself with painting, music, reading, and in becoming what Dorothy calls an active climber of the hills. So that October, Dorothy and Mary travelled by cart from the falling um, to Seathwaite. So you'll see this in the exhibition as well. This is a, a rough approximation of, of the route that we think that they took that um, Paul Westover and Indira are bringing together. So what they what they were supposed to do on the day that they climbed Scarfell Pike was climb uh, S Cause, from which Mary had promised a magnificent prospect. So they acquired a guide in Seathwaite at the end of the, the green line there, which is where they leave the cart and start walking. Um, so they acquire, acquire their shepherd guide, they set up up the fell, and, and they, they're feeling very refreshed by the autumn air. It's an unusually uh, warm October day, um, Dorothy said, describes the sweet warmth of the unclouded sun. Um, the, so we can't know exactly where, where they walked, but Dorothy is, is relatively detailed about the route. And also, um, this map data is taken from the Lake District National Park Authority's public footpath data. Um, which has uh, a lot of similarities even today with the, the kinds of routes that Dorothy's taking. So there's a sense um, when we're engaging with, with data and with maps like this that actually <laughs> we're still following in Dorothy's footsteps even if we're not necessarily always uh, acknowledging her. So when they reached the summit of S Cause, Dorothy was not disappointed with the view. She felt grateful for that vigour of body which enabled her to climb the high mountain as in the days of her youth. She records her exhilaration as she looks out over the region. Um, this is her looking over Wasdale, where she exclaims, but how shall I speak of the peculiar deliciousness of the third prospect? At, that time, at this time, that was the most favoured by sunshine and shade. The green veil of Esk, deep and green, with its glittering serpent stream was below us, and on we looked to the mountains near the sea, Black Coombe and others, and still beyond the sea, it, it, the sea itself in dazzling brightness. Turning round, we saw the mountains of Wasdale and Tumult, and Great Gable, though the middle of the mountain, was to us as its base looked very grand. This, I think, is, um, is some further evidence of that embodied spell that Dorothy um, sometimes is capable of casting. She captures here a moment of, um, of a kind of personal landscaping. This isn't necessarily um, a, a sort of objective form of, um, of the geography, but it's a very personal moment. That tumult of Wasdale is reflected in, um, in Dorothy's grammar, I think. Um, so that long sentence here is broken up by the commas and the dashes in ways that mimic that quick glancing motion of the eye as it trips over the mountains that crowd in around her. It's a version of the, of the picturesque that um, Dennis, Denise Van Reynen thinks leads to the potential for radical revelation of Dorothy's relationship to her surroundings. So there's a kind of aesthetic rebellion going on here as well as a physical one. That realisation of a sort of monumental connection between herself and the mountains seems to have physically invigorated Dorothy. So at this point, they're supposed to go home. Um, and notwithstanding the miles they've already walked that day, they look out across to Great Gable and to Scarfell and think, well, we're basically a third up it, so we may as well carry on. Um, um, so although the distance turns out to be greater than it appeared, she writes, still their courage did not fail. I just want to pause for a moment at that concept of courage. Um, I think it's really easy for us to forget now when we're faced with every day um, with so many exploits of, um, of amazing climbers and, and, and um, mountaineers in other contexts, um, undertaking these um, amazing adventures and uh, amazing feats of physical endurance and, and prowess. 
that to think of Scarfell Pike as being a thing that required that kind of courage um, it might seem a little uh, odd to us uh, today. So I just wanted to pause for a moment with another, um, another account from uh, the mid-1860s of climbing Scarfell Pike that picks up on that idea of courage and I think nicely emblematizes why this was such a big deal. Um, why Scarfell Pike might have required a similar kind of courage to, um, to climbing a much, a much bigger mountain later in the century. So this is a page from Eliza Lynn Linton's The Lake Country. Uh, Lynn Linton was the daughter of the vicar at Crossthwaite, um, and she was actually the first salaried female journalist in Britain. And what she does in this description of the climb of, of her climb of Scarfell is capture a sense of, of how daunting uh, that ascent felt. So she notices in this guidebook that the distance to the mountain seems to continually shift. She seems to record, you know that moment where you're climbing a mountain and you think you've got to the summit and then there's another one and another one and another one. That's kind of how she feels about the Scarfell Pike. Um, and these engravings which were done by her husband, William Linton, capture that sense. Um, so he records what it, it looks like to, um, to move up the mountain. There's a sort of Ruskinian connection here between uh, sketch and text that um, that are attempting in some way to, to replicate that feeling of, of what it's like to walk up um, the mountain in this period. So texts like this, I think, um, really draw out the, that sense that Dorothy's not entirely unsatirical need for courage in the face of Scarfell Pike seemed entirely legitimate in, in the light of, um, of the way that Scarfell was imagined throughout this period. Anyway, back to Dorothy. Dorothy uh, and Mary reached the, the base, and they ascertained that the mountain at that point was too steep to attempt in any case. But rather than give up, they change course slightly and begin instead to ascend Scarfell Pike. By the time Dorothy wrote the letter a week or so later, she'd discovered that the measurers of mountains had estimated the pike to be the highest summit anyway. In 1790, it had been proved to be England's highest mountain. As they reached the top of Scarfell Pike, Dorothy and Mary realised that they had climbed out of the reach of the Lakeland soundscape. So they pause and keep silence to listen, and Dorothy writes that not a sound of any kind is to be heard. Not even an insect hummed in the air. Sublimity here seems to transform into serenity as Dorothy looks out from the top of Scarfell Pike. So she writes, The veils before described when she's on the top of Escort's lay in view, and side by side with Esdale, we now saw the sister vale of Donadale terminated by the Dutton Sands. But the majesty of the mountains below and close to us is not to be conceived. We now beheld the whole mass of Great Gable from its base, the then of Wasdale at our feet, the gulf immeasurable, Grassmoor and the other mountains of Crummock, Annadale, and its mountains, and the sea beyond. So from the top of Scarfell Pike, Dorothy recaptures that sense of fragmented unity that she's already expressed from S. Cause. Her new and even higher perspective allows her to see with even more clarity the connections between disparate elements of the landscape, and that physical response to the view is replicated in her writing. If, as we saw earlier, walking backwards and forwards was particularly conducive to poetry, climbing Scarfell seems to have inspired a certain kind of topographical prose. Um, so, for instance, here a colon indicates the termination of Dunnerdale by the Dutton Sands, um, but it, it still allows for a connection between the estuary and the mountains. Um, the Wasdale Mountains seem to belong in a group of their own. The full stop there separates them from the Scarfells, uh, separates the Cromex from the Scarfells. And the dash mimics the gulf immeasurable that seems to separate Scarfell Pike from Wasdale. So, in short, Dorothy's grandma seems to remap the mountain and the view from it in line with her personal experience of the geography. Harriet Martineau, um, in uh, the mid-1850s, does, does something similar. She thinks that she's mimicking William um, at that, that point. She's actually mimicking Dorothy. But although she picks out different points of um, different objects in the view, the grammar that she uses is, is really similar. She captures a similar sense of a kind of fragmented cohesion, if I can use that terrible phrase. So as Dorothy concludes the letter, the imaginative implications of this embodied response to the mountain become clear. She recalls a singular occurrence from S. Course uh, and when she's been gazing out across the dazzling sea. At this point, she and Mary have noticed a small detail. 
She writes, I forgot to tell you that I spied a ship on the glittering sea while we were looking over Estelle. Is it a ship? replied the guide. A ship? Yes, it can be nothing else. Don't you see the shape of it? Miss Barker interposed, it is a ship, of that I am certain. I cannot be mistaken. I am so accustomed to the appearance of ships at sea. <laughs> I feel that some of you know what's coming here. <laughs> so in the manner of the ancient mariner, Dorothy's eye attempts to read this glittering sea. This is a kind of the what a ship quotes she moment. Um, and she proclaims, a, as it turns out, a false sense of confidence in being able to read the seascape as well as she can read the landscape. It's only at this point in the letter that Dorothy uses I rather than we. But here, that independence is highlighted ironically. It's immediately proved to be misjudged. Just when the guy's doubts seem to have been soundly put to rest, it turns out that he was right to question the apparition. She goes on to say, the guy dropped the <laughs> argument. But a minute was scarcely gone when he quietly said, now look at your ship. It is now a horse. <laughs> so indeed it was, with a gallant neck and head. We laughed heartily, and I hope when I am again inclined to positiveness, I may remember the ship and the horse upon the glittering sea, and the calm confidence, yet submission, of our wise man of the mountains, who certainly had more knowledge of clouds than we, whatever might be our knowledge of ships. <laughs> The guy's detailed knowledge of the, of the local weather here enables him to, to read those details correctly at a distance. And in this instance, it's, an, it's another thing that, that Dorothy turns out to be very good at. And the passage really marks the certainties that are displayed in the, in the rest of the letter. This ship, horse, cloud, vision challenges Dorothy's face in positivism. And rightly, it indicates the extent to which all of her kind of mountain experiences are um, contingent on her own um, personal perspective as is true of us all. But what Dorothy's letter does do is draw attention to different ways of reading the mountain. In one moment she describes, as we've seen, a landscape that stretches out for miles from the summit on which she stands. But at the next, she looks down, and she realises that though the summit of Scarfell Pike seems lifeless at first glance, actually beauty can be found clinging to the rocks if one looks closely enough and if one knows how to read them. So she, she concludes the letter by saying, I ought to have described the last part of our ascent to Scarfell Pike. There, not a blade of grass was to be seen, hardly a cushion of moss, and that was parched and brown, and only growing rarely between the huge blocks and stones which cover the summit, and lie in heaps all round to a great distance, like skeletons or bones of the earth not wanted at the creation, and here left to be covered with never-dying lichens, which the clouds and dews nourish and adorned with colours of the most vivid and exquisite beauty, and endless in variety. This is what Simon Bainbridge would recognise as a climber's eye view, and Dorothy here focuses on the summit's own beauties rather than the views from it. It's not about getting to the top of the mountain and taking a picture from the top of it to see, to demonstrate what you can see or that you've done it. It's about getting there and, and mindfully being in the moment, of recognising that moss clinging to a rock can be as stunning as being able to see all the way to Snowden. <coughs> in focusing on those details close to hand, Dorothy presents us with a rather different perspective to what we're used to reading. She anticipates writers like Nan Shepherd here, I think, in proposing an alternative to what a lot of critics have thought of as masculinist accounts that emphasise a kind of victory over a feminised mother nature when the climber conquers the summit. Nan Shepherd thought that the plateau was the true summit of the Cairngorms, since it was here that the mountain's details were thrown into relief. But walking, Shepherd writes, was necessary for that discovery, because only in walking can the mountaineer really seem to become the mountain. In that kind of perfect state, Shepherd found that place and mind may interpenetrate till the nature of both is altered. In the Lakeland Fells over a century earlier, Dorothy had found something similar. The view from the summit is stunning, but no less important are those never-dying lichens on it. When she reads the summit as if it's a plateau, Dorothy reveals that the mountains apparently bare rocks host abundant life that seem to be nourished by its sheer proximity to the clouds. That ability to discover a really rich detail in apparent bleakness means that the endless variety that Dorothy locates on the mountain is translated into her writing. We skip forward a few years to 1830. When Dorothy was staying in Leicestershire with her nephew John, um, she caught an infection. With a sad irony, William identified the origin of that complaint as being imprudent exposure during a long walk. 
Later that winter, Dorothy herself wrote to Charles and Mary Lamb that she'd been the whole of this winter set aside as a walker. And she never fully recovered. Within a few years, she'd lost the use of her legs and had to be pushed around the house and terrace in a bath chair by a manservant and the occasional willing visitor like Henry Pratt Robinson. By the early 1830s, Dorothy was showing pronounced signs of dementia. She was barely 60, as if her mind simply couldn't function without walking. But although she, couldn't, she could no longer walk, she did continue to write. Perhaps the best known, and certainly the most affecting poem from these years, is Thoughts from My Sick Bed, the poem that's inspired Louise Ann Wilson's um, part of the exhibition next door. Thoughts from My Sick Bed is a kind of dark answer to I Wandered Lonely as a Cloud, which transforms the Wordsworthian couch into a form of inescapable torment. Dora Wordsworth wrote to Edward Quillenan about the poem on May the 25th, 1832. Um, so this is an image um, of the exhibition next door for those of you who've not yet seen it. Dora writes, I hope Dorothy will sometime let me send you an affecting poem which she has written on the pleasure she received from the first spring flowers that were carried up to her when confined to her sick room. The last three stanzas of which I, I remember I will steal for you. And these are the final three stanzas of, of, of that poem. I felt the power I felt before. Controlling weakness, languor, pain. It bore me to the terrace walk. I trod the hills again. No prisoner in this lonely room. I saw the green banks of Y. Recalling my prophetic words, bard, brother, friend from infancy. No need of motion or of strength, or even the breathing air. I thought of nature's loveliest scenes, and with memory I was there. Dora continues, you must excuse the limping measure. Aunt cannot write regular meter. But what Dora takes to be a fault, I'd argue, is a deliberate poetic innovation from Dorothy. She's replicating, as close as she can, I think, her own embodied memory. So just as we saw, uh, in fact, we didn't, never mind. Um, so just as we saw her kind of replicating the, her movements on, on Scarfell um, in, in that kind of topographical prose that I was talking about a minute ago, here she's, um, she's limping through this verse in the way that she um, she remembers strolling around it um, and clambering around the Lakeland Fells. That limping measure, I think, recalls something of Dorothy's own gait as she imagine, imaginatively revisits the terrace walk and the hills. And Dorothy's journal really obsesses over those final two stanzas. Um, Louise Ann Wilson's done something really lovely with this in, um, next door, as you'll see in a moment. Um, in the journal, Dorothy writes variations of these stanzas out again and again, sometimes sideways, sometimes at various angles across the page. The irregularity of those manuscripts indicates something of Dorothy's mental distress as she writes again and again, a prisoner in this quiet room, imprisoned in this lonely room, no need of motion or of strength, no need of motion or of strength. The lines seem to pace about the page, even if Dorothy can't prowl around that lonely room. And one of those jottings is, I think, particularly revealing about how Dorothy remembers nature's best gifts. Written sideways down the page, sometime in 1833, Dorothy adds, and if perchance my feet shall come, thoughts, images of early youth. The movement of feet, both the remembered or imagined motion of her own walking and the structure of the poem itself, allow her to recollect her early years. This is a sad conclusion to an extraordinary career, but the habits of mountaineering that Dorothy had developed in her prime continue to influence her and her contemporaries long after she could no longer physically get to the fells. Her ability to recall the details that had so moved her on her walks helped to transport her back to the mountains that she'd loved so deeply. But Dorothy's walking and writing had further reaching consequences. That daring mountaineering established walking as a central occupation for almost all the women in the Lake Poets Circle and the routes that she walked, rewalked, and recorded opened up the pathways to women and other walkers who followed, even if unknowingly, in her footsteps. Even today, we might trace some of our own routes, and perhaps more importantly, some of our ways of reading meaning in the mountains, back to pioneers like Dorothy. Thank you.